So, I just played Undertale for the first time after miraculously avoiding spoilers for it for the past five years. And although I went in knowing that it was an immensely popular and well-loved game, I admit I wasn't sure how it could live up to the hype. Loading it up, it seemed nice enough with the potential for an interesting story, but I had no idea how it could rise up to that global praise, and I had no idea how it would affect me. As a screen therapy review, I'll be looking at how Undertale affects us as players emotionally and psychologically. My channel's about making positive media psychology accessible for those of us who want to make the most of our experiences with movies and games. Positive media psychology is the field of research about how we can use media, like games and movies, in strategic and mindful ways to benefit our emotional and psychological lives. Through the lens of positive media psych, I'll analyze the mechanics and story and explain what lessons we can bring into our real lives from our travels and choices on our way to new home. For these purposes, I'll be discussing the true pacifist path of Undertale. While there is a lot to say about the genocide or neutral routes, I argue that the pacifist ending is the path that offers players the most psychologically strengthening experiences. I'll also be discussing the positive effects of achieving the pacifist ending with good intentions, as in achieving the ending through a genuine desire to spare all monsters. Cause technically you could achieve the pacifist ending without truly feeling affection for any of the characters, but I'll be talking about the player's experience while motivated by genuine compassion over completionism. On my playthrough, I can pinpoint the exact moment I learned what Undertale was capable of. I had made it through the tutorial, enjoying the intro sequence, and although I loved the idea of living with Toriel, I of course knew that my mission was beyond the gate. So like all of us, I was forced to fight her so that I could leave. I tried again and again to talk her out of fighting. Eventually, I gave up on sparing her and figured that maybe I had to fight a little. She was such a sweet character, I felt really uncomfortable trying to land a hit, but I wasn't sure what the game wanted me to do. I thought maybe I had to chip away at her health points until she gave up. That's usually what happens when you have to fight someone nice in a game. They never die, but you have to weaken them in order to trigger some kind of dialogue or a cutscene. I can't describe the way my stomach dropped when what I thought was going to be just another chip off of her health turned into a killing blow. I felt so awful. I closed the game immediately without saving, hoping that I could resurrect her. I didn't know it then, but I was already under the game's spell by doing this. I knew resetting the game was cheating, but I felt like I'd rather be a cheater than a murderer. That's how emotionally invested I was in the game already. So I reloaded and Toriel was alive again, I was so relieved. So I did it all again and pretended like it was my first playthrough, but this time I was going to do the right thing. When I confronted her again, I blasted through the dialogue, though I noticed something weird. She said that I looked like I had seen a ghost. I tried to shrug that off, maybe it was part of the dialogue that I missed the first time. But anyways, through sheer perseverance that I wasn't used to giving a game like this, I was able to finally spare her. I was so happy to know that she would go back to her books and pies and silly jokes. So I went through those doors out of the ruins, proud of myself, ready to forget my mistake. But that's when I, like all of us, saw Flowey again. He was already kind of scary, but when he told me he saw what I did, when he said he saw me kill her my first time around and criticized me for resetting the game to save her, I felt a shock that I hadn't felt from a game in a long time. From that moment, I was pulled in 100%. Suddenly, I wasn't just guiding a random little avatar through the motions. Instead, I felt as if Flowey, or the game itself, was talking to me. From that gut-turning moment, the entire landscape of the game changed. Suddenly, I was in this game. That typical disconnect between myself as a real person and the characters I play in traditional RPGs disappeared. I understood that this game was going to take my choices seriously, and it was going to judge what I did even in the menu screens. And more than that, I realized that in this game, you can't just mindlessly reload or do lots of good deeds and pick the paragon option or farm good karma until you reach a kind of goodness quota to unlock a happy ending. I came to understand that unlike with other morality meters and games, this wasn't about me budgeting how much goodness I needed to get the ending I wanted. Instead, I was going to actually have to think about everything I did. I was going to have to care about every interaction, because every interaction meant something more than just karma or friendship points. 
As I progressed to Snowden, I felt a kind of stage fright. My action suddenly felt important and significant in a way that's rare for a game to inspire, but it was deeply psychologically engaging. And that's when I realized why playing Undertale was such a meaningful experience for everyone. Undertale challenges us to consider what is right, what is wrong, and how much we'll persevere to defend those moral definitions. There are many benefits to the meaningful nature of Undertale's story and mechanics, and I'll be breaking down what these benefits are and where they come from. But to get there, let's first dive a little deeper into how we, as the human player, exist in the world of Undertale. On our way through the underground, we as the human player are seen and addressed personally. We're recognized as a distinct entity, not by everyone, but enough times that we feel like our unique presence is directly affecting the world in the game. We learn more and more about how in this world, the human soul, our real life human soul, is fabled for its power to change the fate of every monster in the underground. Which makes sense since we're the ones directing the progress of the game. Human souls are even powerful enough to save and reset the reality that these monsters live in. It's kind of trippy for a game to be so self-aware of its save-reset function, but it's actually written into the story as a power that we possess as the player. In fact, canonically, it's our real-life human soul and determination that's strong enough to take that save-reset power from Flowey when we load up the game for the first time. Before us, Flowey was playing Undertale on his own, saving and resetting its reality endlessly, so in a way this was Flowey's game and we took it from him. When he tells us this, it's hard to really digest at first, but this metaphysical blending of game reality and our reality makes our time in Undertale feel even more meaningful. And if we do a little bit more digging, we'll actually see that it's our actions and determination that gives our little avatar their identity, literally. It's our guiding hand that makes one of the two character states appear for our avatar. Getting a little bit more into the lore, if you kill Toriel without mercy, this will actually trigger Flowey to recognize that your avatar is actually Kara, or whatever the name was that you input at the beginning of the game. This character is the reincarnation of the first fallen human that was revealed to have manipulated the royal family into conflict with the humans, bringing tragedy to the kingdom many years ago. Kara was the instigator of the conflict that sets the scene for a time in the game where the monsters are stuck in the underground, aimless and in a kind of limbo. And we learn through the game that Kara was only motivated by revenge and a desire for power. If you complete the genocide ending, killing every monster you meet, Kara will actually take over completely and become powerful enough to steal the save-reset power from us, the human player. Kara will go on, like Flowey, to play the game in an endless loop to become powerful over and over again. On the other hand, if you play showing mercy to everyone and get the pacifist ending, our avatar is revealed to be Frisk, a kind and compassionate human who just happened to fall into the underground. But Frisk is not us, and neither is Kara. We're still separate from both character states of our avatar. This makes for a strange play experience, but one where our presence is meaningful enough as it is. We aren't in the game with the body, we don't need a presence in the game, because we're the missing ingredient, the human soul, the sheer determination that inspires our avatar to become either Kara or Frisk. Usually, RPGs want us to feel like we're the playable character to create a sense of immersion, but viewing my contribution to the game as the guiding force for Frisk's evolution somehow pulled me in even more. I wasn't being asked to pretend I was Frisk. I was still me. I was still Courtney. But I was helping Frisk and everyone else in the underground in my own way. So Undertale was written to make it obvious that it was a world sorely missing the one powerful, game-defining ingredient that we all bring to any game we play. Our decisions and our actions that move the story along. This level of psychological involvement for the player culminates in a deeply meaningful experience for us. Okay, so you might have noticed that I've been saying the word meaningful a lot. I swear, I'm not just too lazy to look up synonyms. I describe the gameplay as meaningful like meaningful with a capital M. Media psychologists dub media meaningful when it elicits more than just a pleasure experience particularly when the media encourages us to reflect on our inner selves, on human nature, 
and the purpose of our life or our actions. For those of us familiar with all the themes Undertale explores, we can see right away that it falls into this meaningful category. And for those who are familiar with my other reviews, you might recognize that this inclusion of meaningful choice and consequences in the story, along with an emotionally complex narrative, would make Undertale a piece of eudaimonic media. Eudaimonic is what we call media at one end of a spectrum of emotional impact. It's when the story includes complex emotions or discussions about deeper themes of tragedy or inspiration at the other end of the spectrum, or where media live when they inspire only happy, lighthearted, or sweet emotions. Of course, Undertale isn't just serious tragedy, it still charms us with its funny design and dialogue, and so we end up finding it in the sweet spot between the two categories. Media that lives here offers us the best of both worlds. We can get the psychological and subjective benefits of both. I've covered these benefits multiple times in my other videos, so really quickly, the benefits of eudaimonic media are heightened subjective well-being, psychological growth, strengthened emotional resilience, insightful self-reflection, and fortified emotional stability. And the benefits of hedonic media are positive emotions, feelings of rest and recovery, flexible thinking, relief of anxiety-induced cardiovascular reactions, and a short-term sense of subjective well-being. So I could go on and on about each of these and what they mean, but this essay is about how Undertale has provoked profound emotional experiences for its players, and how it can actually be used as a tool to learn about our inner values, how to assert them, and even how to expand them. By playing something meaningful and challenging like this game, we're actually strengthening our virtues and emotional skills that can influence our real lives. That's right, meaningful interactive experiences like games can actually help us grow, learn, and adopt new habits. This is why we sometimes feel like a game can be so important to us that we might call it life-changing, as has been the case for many Undertale fans. So with that, let's dive into the virtue-strengthening themes of Undertale's morality-centered story. Okay, to get at what makes the morality of Undertale so revolutionary, I'm going to need to go a little further into the Wonderland rabbit hole that is Undertale lore. I'll do my best to keep it brief and accessible though, so bear with me because I swear it's worth it in the end. I want to bring up an interesting interpretation of the genocide wreaking Kara that I saw. This interpretation is that Kara is the embodiment of how we might typically play a monster-filled RPG. We've all played RPGs that arm us with a stick, gives us an experience meter, and points us in the direction of a monster, and we know from years of experience we're just supposed to go up to it and kill it so that we can gain treasure, experience, power, and maybe we can level up. Games that require violence to meet objectives encourage a certain amount of moral disengagement. It's not necessarily harmful to players, but it's become a standard in gameplay to kind of switch off that part of our brain. We've learned how to separate our real-life moral centers from the somewhat violent characters we play in these games. Like if someone asked me to run up to a random monster, pick a fight, kill it, and loot its body, I might want to slow down for a second and consider my options. Whereas in a game, I'm used to just seeing a monster and knowing it's okay to kill it. This kind of mentality makes a large number of our actions in these violence-based games less personal or significant. As Link in Breath of the Wild, I don't really care when I kill my hundredth bokoblin. The stories in these kinds of games might still be moving and emotionally investing, but they won't inspire the same consistent mindfulness and resilience training that a game like Undertale does. So, in a way, the Undertale Genocide run reflects a normal or even a good run of a typical RPG. In the Genocide ending, Kara remarks that they've learned a lot through her guidance and helped them discover that the purpose of their reincarnation was to become powerful. And this realization is chilling. It's a brutal reflection of how games are typically set up, how we've been trained to see monsters in games as meaningless, item-dropping mannequins. But Undertale was written to combat that. Each monster, heck, even all mannequins, have personal motivations, hopes, fears, and in the end, just kinda wanna be left alone. Really driving this point home, when you meet Sans a new home, he explains that what we thought was experience or level was actually measuring our ability to execute monsters or commit violence. He explains that these stats actually show you how good you're getting at distancing yourself emotionally from your actions so that it's easier for you to hurt others. So you've been leveling up your ability to kill, but degrading your skills and empathy and compassion. 
Toby Fox even described how he was motivated to make Undertale a game where you don't have to kill anyone, since he saw that most RPG games were kind of like murder fests. So it makes sense if this is why the genocide ending was written like this, and it also makes sense that that's why Kara is the character that you can name in the beginning, because Kara is the more typical RPG character that you get to customize. So overall, Undertale wakes us up from the traditional, transactional, and mathematical perspective of morality and games, and instead brings us into a deeply engaging and mindful state of play where we're intrinsically motivated to treat characters kindly, not for a reward, but for its own sake. Though just as a disclaimer, this isn't me down-talking any other games. I might have used Breath of the Wild as an example of moral disengagement, but it's still one of my favorite games ever made, despite its moral flexibility. Asking players to disengage a little and stay neutral isn't a bad thing. In fact, it can be relaxing, especially since our daily lives might be full of moral conundrums that cause stress, and so we might not be wanting to make tough moral decisions in our spare time too. Not all games need to have moral dilemmas. Games like Breath of the Wild have their benefits, and Undertale has its own. And those benefits would be getting the chance to practice our virtues, mindfulness, and to reinforce useful emotional skills. The secret to winning Undertale isn't how to level up or unlock new attacks. The key to really winning is learning to genuinely care about the characters, the monsters, and even Flowey. Undertale challenges us to be mindful. From our first encounter with a helpful Froggit, or when we meet Toriel, we're given the choice to kill or spare others, but are quietly encouraged to practice the empathy needed to spare them. And what many players and reviewers love is that this gets harder as you get further into the story. You encounter monsters that can be pretty annoying or difficult to dodge, and boss battles get harder and harder while you stay at level 1 because you refuse to kill anyone. It's even harder knowing that there's this entire leveling up mechanic designed for you to use it, but you just have to keep making the conscious decision to keep ignoring it, even though it would make life so much easier. Toby Fox commented that this was on purpose. He wanted to make the right choice harder to accomplish. If it was too easy, it wouldn't feel valuable or realistic. Also, we like it when the right path is a little bit more difficult in games because it's good practice for real life where maintaining our integrity is surprisingly difficult since the right thing and the easy thing are almost never the same. So even when all I wanted to do was poke Vulcans or Aarons with a stick to make them go away because they kept getting me, instead, when we're playing compassionately on our way to the true pacifist ending, we make the choice over and over and over again to encourage and flex and flirt and laugh at jokes. Even if it means we die more than a few times and it keeps Frisk weak and flimsy, we make this decision to be kind again and again, no matter how difficult it is. We can even be motivated to take on side quests that also require a lot of resilience. When that snowman asked me to take a piece of him to the end of my journey, it meant a lot to me, more than I thought it would to fulfill my promise. And I didn't know whether putting the piece in a box would negate the mission, so I just left it in my inventory the whole time, letting it take up a slot, and I never ate it. Even when I was fighting Asgore for like the tenth time, and it was looking pretty good. When I actually managed to do it and make the snowman happy, I was surprised at how happy that made me, and at how resilient I had been to get it there. In this way, the skills we are actually leveling up when we keep Frisk at level 1 are skills like patience, empathy, resilience, and tenderness. Frisk doesn't learn to kill, but we as the human player are learning determination. This can actually feel good too. It's really rewarding to know that you took the harder but morally satisfying path, and this is for a reason. Studies have found that by making mindful and difficult decisions over and over again, we can inspire real change in ourselves. When we make the choice to prioritize others over ourselves or help others even when there's a chance to be selfish, and even if this is in a video game, this hard work pays off and inspires us to become more altruistic in our daily lives. It can also help us strengthen the emotional intelligence skills needed to observe people we encounter with the same understanding, curiosity, and care that we practice when we met new monsters in Undertale. Like when encountering a new monster, we can learn not to jump to conclusions and to keep our mind open to understanding the motivations and pains of others. We give the benefit of the doubt to Vulcans or Shirens. We don't assume that they're out to get us, instead they're just confused or hurt. 
If we're mindful, we can bring this patience with us into the real world too. It might help us stay calm and considerate in real life instead of jumping to conclusions and acting too soon. It's hard to practice compassion when we're afraid. It takes a lot of strength to not fall back on knee-jerk reactions. This is one of the greatest challenges in learning experiences in Undertale. Two powerful examples of this are when we're confronted with particularly creepy amalgamate creatures or when we're given the choice to kill or spare Flowey. The amalgamates are pretty creepy and feel like a threat when we first see them. We don't know what they are, so we almost want to just make an assumption and fight them. They're so different than anything we've seen before in our travels, and feel more threatening since we can't understand them. But because we've been training our empathy all the way to the true lab, we have the skill to muscle through that fear, wait, look, and discover their suffering with sympathy before letting them go. This empathy is rewarded when we discover that the amalgamates are actually victims of a terrible experiment gone wrong. And although at the end they still kind of freaked me out, I was happy that I didn't let my fear win and that these creatures could return to their families. Plural. Sparing Flowey is one of the hardest decisions to make. Even he doesn't understand why we would do it. Why we would spare such a terrifying boss who just threatens to come back and get us. Although we might want to kill him because he's been so scary and manipulative and it feels like he'll make good on his threats if we let him go, we find that sparing him is the only option that progresses the story. If you try to kill him, he assumes gleefully that you're just like him and challenges you to another fight, which is what he wanted all along, and will only lead you back to the same decision over and over again. But I argue there's a good reason why. Sparing such a dangerous enemy might feel like the wrong choice, but it was the last lesson to remember that even the scariest or most hurtful people can be pitied and addressed with compassion. It's also the final lesson that we act out to understand that what made life so meaningless to Flowey and Cora was the fact they could only understand self-interest and power. Flowey loves fighting you and wants to keep it up forever, so he doesn't get bored. His and Cora's happy ending isn't an ending. It's non-stop violence and dominance. What enables us to unlock a satisfying and emotionally significant ending is our determination to find meaning in others the monsters, the characters who grow to love, and even the villain of the story. Flowey and Kara just treat the game as a plaything. We find closure by recognizing it as an emotionally meaningful experience characterized by mercy and reconciliation. And so following this, we need to spare Flowey too to get our good ending. It was this moment of mercy that we were training up our emotional skills to accomplish throughout the whole game. All those times we selected Spare even when we were annoyed or creeped out were leading to this moment. On a psychological level, the real boss battle wasn't trying to dodge the impossible barrage of attacks that Flowey unleashed at us. The real boss battle was this screen, when we're choosing to kill or spare him. It takes a lot of resilience, compassion, and hope that we've been strengthening on our journey to pick Mercy not only once, but a total of 13 times in order to complete the scene. I admit I faltered on my fifth mercy, I waited and considered the opposite, but I remained determined to not kill and to take a gamble on goodness. Of course, one important caveat that the writer offers is given when you've saved everyone and you get one last walk through the kingdom before leaving and you find Asriel in the flower field at the very end. Seeing Asriel was such a healing moment of reconciliation. But what Asriel offers us is an important piece of advice that summarizes the game perfectly. There are lots of flowies out there, and not everything can be resolved by just being nice. Don't kill and don't be killed. That's the best you can strive for. This is the exact opposite of Flowey's original advice for us. Flowey could only conceive of two options, kill or be killed. Reunited with his soul and ability to love, Asriel realized that the best we can do is not cause suffering for others and not subject ourselves to unnecessary suffering. Practicing compassion or kindness doesn't mean putting yourself in danger. We can practice compassion, understanding, and forgiveness while also learning to disengage from harmful situations so that we can do our best to not perpetuate cycles of pain and hurt. So, getting to the end of Undertale was pretty stressful. It took a lot of time and grit to double-check everything. 
I would walk back and forth and check areas to see if anything had changed. Towards the end, I kept going back to the door in Papyrus's and Sansa's home, just in case it had opened yet. I exhausted every dialogue option possible, and I farmed enough money to buy Burger Pants's complete stock and any hot dogs I could, and I also managed to get some spider bake sale goods just in case. The fights were stressful, and showing mercy was hard. Even the last walk back to the beginning took a lot of emotional energy as I was scared of missing anything. The whole time I played, I felt engaged, but also a little on edge, always ready for something unexpected to pop out around the corner. When everything was done, and all I had to do was say goodbye, I cried. I was so surprised by my reaction. I wasn't sad because the story was over, I was touched by the comfort that the pacifist ending offered after such a taxing journey. There's real sadness in Undertale, loss, injustice, and tragedy, and a lot of these feelings have no one to blame as most characters are only acting out of fear or pain. There's no vengeance or justice at the end of the pacifist ending, just healing. To me, this ending is a message of hope and what the combination of hope and determination can do for us. Undertale is a rare game because it champions the strength of softness and goodwill over the force of brutality or vengeance. The strongest characters in the game are deeply hurt and are motivated to either receive or give comfort. Reaching the tender conclusion of the pacifist ending is like a healing balm that soothes parts of us we didn't even know needed healing. The characters remind us to not lose hope and to be generous with our presence. We're reminded to be courageous with our kindness to look after ourselves, but always work hard to empathize with people that seem different or scary. Most importantly, we can recognize parts of ourselves in those scary people, our own need for tenderness, forgiveness, and support. When we forgive and comfort those characters, we learn little by little how to do the same for ourselves. These characters have dark sides or secrets that we can forgive. No one is completely innocent, except maybe Papyrus. But even if their secrets or dark sides are unexpected and a little jarring, we work to understand them. This is great training for our emotional intelligence skills that are necessary for our relationships in real life. This feels like another one of the game's parting gifts, a reminder to treat ourselves and others with the same understanding, patience, and softness that we treat the characters we befriended on our journey. This last topic means a lot to me. There's a certain mysterious and overwhelming emotion that a lot of players felt when they got to the true pacifist ending. Looking through dozens of reviews, I saw how everyone was describing the same profound experience, but without a uniform word to describe it. I would have also been at a loss for the vocabulary to describe this experience if I hadn't been familiar with media psychology research. I want to help us understand what exactly this feeling was and how it can actually benefit our personal sense of well-being. One of the most heartfelt reviews I read was by Nathan Grayson of Kotaku. In it, he describes how the game changed him emotionally on several levels. In particular, he talks about a feeling of transcendence, an overwhelming desire to reflect on his life, and an inspiration to work harder to be a positive presence in his relationships and in the world. Like Nathan and countless others, I also felt this emotion during the last few hours of gameplay. The final chapter of Undertale can inspire a deeply moving and motivational feeling that can lead to happy tears, lumps in our throat, chills, goosebumps, and a restlessness to grow and do good. We might have found ourselves crying, or smiling, or both as we fight to the end of the game. We might call this feeling inspiration, but media psychologists have called this rare and powerful emotion elevation. It's called elevation because it feels like we're brought slightly above our usual worldview. We feel like we have a broader and more appreciative perspective of the world, of life, the human condition, and relationships. Feelings of elevation are elicited from our experiences with deeply meaningful media that portray love, connectedness, resilience, and selflessness. It's triggered by witnessing, or even better, participating in stories of moral beauty, virtue, and altruism. It's a highly electric feeling. I felt it come on when I was fighting the final boss battles. It didn't matter that it felt like I couldn't win or kept dying over and over again. I knew I couldn't lose if I just kept trying. I remember feeling it again, seeing our friends come to help us, and feeling it again when I realized that we needed to save Azrael too. Elevation is a very rare and profound emotion, and it can be incredibly infectious. 
We might be feeling it for a game, but it's easy to feel this emotion expand into our real lives. It's one of the few powerful self-transcendent emotions that inspires us to feel for a moment larger than ourselves, to feel in some way connected to the larger human experience and appreciative of its obstacles and blessings. And what I love is that when we feel elevation, when we feel connected to others and the world through meaningful stories of struggle, perseverance, virtue, and love, we naturally feel an excitement to work for the betterment of ourselves and of humanity in general. This sense of moral motivation is one of the greatest benefits of playing a game like Undertale. In fact, it's one of the greatest gifts any piece of media could give us. We're gifted with a healing enthusiasm to be compassionate and resilient, to help and appreciate others. It can change how we see ourselves or how we behave in our relationships for the better. Playing Undertale, we can experience real growth, not just for Frisk, but for ourselves. Just before reaching Asriel in the flower field, you can visit the first froggets that gave you advice. They remember you and see how you've grown. I have to say, when I read that, I really felt it. Having made it all the way through the game after nearly 12 hours, and yes, 12 hours, even though it was only supposed to take 6, I felt like I had earned those little compliments. I really did feel like I had learned a lot. Repeatedly through gameplay, we're encouraged to practice critical compassion over prejudice, generosity over selfishness, and to take a gamble on goodness. And we learn from these repeated decisions, so at the end of our journey we can legitimately feel stronger and more thoughtful as a person. This story shows us the benefits of putting in the hard work to avoid being motivated by greed or fear, and instead to strengthen typically unpraised strengths like kindness, understanding, and forgiveness. Undertale has become such an important game for so many people, not only because of its clever coding and fun writing, but because the game itself is an emotionally challenging and fortifying experience that we have gained a lot from. Finishing the story, I went back out of curiosity to try to reload my save file. When I saw Asriel as the flower telling me to let Frisk and the others stay in their happy ending, to accept this timeline as the ending they all deserved, that interaction brought my time with Undertale to a satisfying close. And so, no matter how much I'd like to go back, I won't ever reset it. I'll let them stay happy. I'll just have to take the determination, hope, and kindness that they taught me and put them to good use in real life. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more about video games in the intersection of media psychology and positive psychology, please go ahead and subscribe. If you have any games you'd like to suggest, please go ahead and add them in the comments below. And as always, happy playing.